excited. This is exciting. We have a lot of cool stuff coming to you guys tonight. And uh, why don't we just start off with a little toast to our audience? If you, if oh you yes, toast. boom, Clay, okay. to you, Lori Dunham from Texas, giving you a shout out, Patrick. <laughs> nice. What's up, Lori? All right. So, where do we start here? Well, um, our goal tonight is to share something a little awesome with you. You're going to get to know us a little better. And um, it's not all about us, though, but we want to share some of our story with you, uh, my story, and then Patrick, his story. And uh, some of the, frankly, shaping and um, sometimes gut-wrenching lessons that uh, we've learned through our real estate careers. Uh, but I want to be very clear in emphasizing that this is about you guys. Uh, this is not about us. And first off, let me begin by saying thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for being here and being a part of this with us because your time is valuable. I know my time is valuable and yours is as well. There's a lot of other things that you could be doing right now. You could be spending time with your family. You could be, I don't know, watching the man from Snowy River. That's what my family's maybe, doing in the next room. Maybe some uh, candy crush. Some can or some, actual, some Halloween candy. I've got a bucket of it over here because I don't trust my kids to keep it in their room. But there's a lot of other stuff you guys could be doing right now. You're here with us, and we're grateful for that. And we want to do our very best to make it worth your while tonight and make sure that you walk away with uh, some really valuable stuff. You're probably wondering, these guys got something to sell. Hmm. What are they trying to pull here? What kind of tomfoolery are we going to have to deal with? Well, we do have something to sell, but it's not what you're probably thinking. Folks, tonight... For sale, we have big ideas, <laughs> big ideas to challenge you, to inspire you, to sharpen you, and hopefully to shape you for the better. And the cost for you tonight for these big shaping ideas is not the $32,997 value, but only around an hour or so of your time. Uh, I would say depending on how many questions you guys have and what kind of questions you have. And that's because we're going to be answering your questions. Uh, we are going to open up the floor here in just a little while. We want to know whatever the kind of questions you guys have. It might have to do with what we talk about tonight. It might be totally unrelated. Uh, it could just be a real estate investing question, whatever it is. Part of the experience here tonight of being here with you is we want to make an additional investment in just answering whatever kind of questions you got. Okay? We have uh, Between the two of us, we have about 27, 28 years of cumulative uh, real estate investing experience. Uh, we both have a lot of ups in the business over those years and a lot of downs and a lot of lessons that we've learned and we're happy to to let you stand on the shoulder of our experiences and learn from that. So, what's this all about? Well, first, we're going to kick off something, something truly awesome, something that we want to invite you to be a part of with us. Uh, it is we're not going to ask you to pull your wallet out for it. It's uh, completely gratis. It's 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 part of us serving you because that's part of our core values and you'll hear more about that here in just a moment but it officially kicks off tonight uh, we've kept it tightly under wraps and we're ready to let the cat out of the bag this has been in the works for months and, and I mean, a long time and so it's awesome that you're here with us for us to unveil this at the end and you're gonna love it um, that's all I'll say for now yeah 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 we don't want to get ahead of ourselves so uh, we're also going to share very openly tonight, I've alluded to this, uh, we're going to be speaking from our own real life experiences and um, one, of the, one of the values that Patrick and I share is just being real with you guys and being uh, open and honest about some of the stuff that we've been through. Uh, so we're not trying to get you to cry as a river over anything, but you know we're, we're actually both uh, very grateful for the shaping experiences we've had that have been hard. Some of those tough spots, those low points that we've been through because they've made us better versions of ourselves. And uh, Patrick, I don't know about you, but I kind of wear them as a badge of honor. It gives me an opportunity to help someone else avoid similar struggles. Exactly. We're going to try and drive home one very important, I would say game-changing idea for you tonight. And I mean this is a big, big idea. 
Uh, we're going to talk about other things, but if you walk away with nothing else but this one idea, uh, I think it really can be a game changer for you. And I, I am going out on a limb and calling it the single biggest, most important thing that you must learn and understand that your ultimate success or failure in real estate hinges upon. I know that's a big promise and it probably sounds like a lot of hype, but I think if you'll track along with me, you'll see where I'm going. It's going to make sense. We're also, as I said, going to answer your questions. Uh, anything goes. doesn't matter what kind of questions you got. Uh, I will ask, if you don't mind, Patrick's going to kind of keep a, a, an eye on the questions in there. Uh, but um, keep your questions as much as you can till the end. Uh, maybe write them down on a piece of paper, and that might be helpful just so that we can try and keep things kind of tightly focused. Um, but we want to know your questions, so make, make sure and uh, make a note of them one way or another when they hit you. We want to inspire, motivate, and dream a little bit together tonight. And right. before, before you get to the ahead, JP, um, yep. I, I want you all to understand, too, that tonight this is not about a brand new real estate tactic or strategy that you can use yesterday to make $50,000. Um, if you're looking for just tactic, this isn't it. Um, this is deeper than that. And I hope that you can just really absorb what we share tonight um, because it's going to come from the heart and we're going to share it just because we're here to just be open and real. Um, so that's what you're going to get here. Um, and we're so excited about it. So excited about it. I also want to let you guys know, if you didn't pick up on this, uh, this is actually the first of three parts. Uh, tonight, tomorrow night, and the following night, we're going to be live. We're going to be answering questions all three nights, but each night we're going to focus in on something different. Uh, each night we only have big ideas for sale, so uh, none of, we're not leading up to a sales pitch. There's no, we're not, we're not launching a, a product we're going to ask you to buy. There's nothing, you know, just take your, your suspicions and set them to the side and just uh, enjoy the experience and learn from it and um, use us and abuse us uh, while you have access to us at this level. Um, but to give you an idea, here's what's ahead after this. Uh, tomorrow night and the next night, uh, some of what we're going to cover is, for example, the real estate investor's essential life cycle. This is something that it took me a lot of years to figure out even existed. Um, I wish I had learned this earlier on in my career. It would have saved me a lot of headache just to get the bird's eye view of what this life cycle looks like you know kind of like the the map at the mall and you see you see the whole thing from above and then you see the little red dot that says you are here that's what we're talking about but for the real estate investing life cycle so that's ahead of us the five major milestones that every successful real estate investor must walk through uh, we're going to talk about the two major linchpins of your awesome success or Epic failure. Epic failure. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the biggest obstacles that you and we all face as real estate investors. Um, we're more specifically going to talk about how to identify and obliterate those. Exactly. And identify and obliterate. Identify and obliterate. And the tactical trap. Uh, we're going to talk about what the tactical trap is, why most investors fall head first into it and how to avoid it. I'm my, I myself did for many years. And uh, the three axioms of awesome, which I'm pretty proud of as a name. I, I think it's pretty pretty clever, but I'm just going to keep that one shrouded in mystery until we get to it. So again, now, that is all coming up soon on the nights to follow. Yes. So join us tomorrow night and Thursday night. Yes. Do what you can to be a, be a part of this with us uh, live, okay? Uh, I dare you. We dare you to really dive in with us here. Uh, by the way, this is a picture of, uh, of Patrick and I when we were uh, recently we were indoor skydiving, which was awesome at uh, iFly in Austin. Uh, we want to challenge you to really dive in with us there. You see what I did there, the dive in? Get it? It's, I thought it was clever. Anyway, engage with us tonight. Set your expectations aside for a moment, whatever they are, and just Open your mind. As I said, make a note of your questions so that you don't forget what they are, and make a note of any 
thing that you this kind of an aha or wow I never thought of it that way before because if you don't capture those things you know ideas someone once told me ideas are like delicate soap bubbles floating around near jagged rocks at any moment that idea that 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 thing that you're finding so attractive and valuable and 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 inspiring could just pop and be gone if you don't capture it so Make sure you do that. Share and care with us tonight, and don't forget to be awesome. Well, and, and one um, I just saw in the questions panel, Lori said uh, the video is blocking the screen. Um, I just wanted to mention if anybody's having an issue with the video feed here over the screen, there should be something that you can drag, drop, select to uh, to shrink the video or move the video to a side of your screen. Yeah. Um, Let's see here. All right, cool. Let's do it. Okay. So, who are these cats anyway? Uh, I realized as we were thinking through what we're going to cover tonight that um, many of you do know us. You're friends of ours. You've been a, a subscriber or a, a member, perhaps, of one of our uh, one of our joint projects uh, for some time. But a lot of you guys probably are relatively new to one or both of us and don't know us uh, as well as we'd like you to know us. So we want to take just a moment and just give you a snapshot of, I guess, who we are and why we're even somebody you might want to pay attention to talking to. So, Patrick, why don't we start with you? Quick backstory. All right, quick backstory. Um, I live in live on Isle of Palms, right outside of Charleston. I've been here for 13 years. Uh, I've always lived in South Carolina, um, and from a couple hours away, not far. Uh, I bought my first real estate investment property while in college, and it inspired me to quit. Yes. And I have been at this real estate investing thing ever since. Um, I've done a little bit of everything from fix and flips, buy and holds, holds through rentals, through lease options, probate deals, bankruptcy, pre-foreclosure, you name it, um, have probably done a deal in that niche or strategy. So. Um, I love real estate. I love sharing, and uh, that's really been my journey over the last number of years, reaching out and connecting and sharing just all the knowledge and experience from now over a decade of hands-on, in the trenches, real estate experience. Bam. Okay. Uh, Brad Patterson says we look like brothers. Which one of us is better looking, though, Brian? Brian, good to have you on, man. He's a local investor here in Charleston. Okay, I'm curious which one of us is better looking, Brian. So a little one-person poll, maybe you could leave us a comment. So uh, brief, short story of, uh, of JP. I got started in real estate investing in, um, in 2000 after uh, reading Robert Kiyosaki's book. I jumped in headfirst into rentals initially, and um, it was a struggle. <laughs> Um, I also, you know, I heard that you're always supposed to uh, join your local real estate association, your local RIA, and I didn't have one here in Memphis at the time, so I thought, well, I don't know much about real estate, but I kind of know a little bit about herding cats, so I'm gonna, I'll am gonna, i just start a RIA. So I started our local RIA, and I grew that uh, for six years, 2000 to 2006, alongside growing my real estate investing business. Uh, over the course of my career, I have done a little bit of a lot of things, a lot of different types of deals. Um, I uh, have done everything from short sales to, you know, I've been an REO broker. I have uh, dabbled in rehabbing and lease options and notes. Uh, but it, after a little while, I stuck my flag deep into wholesaling, and wholesaling is my bread and butter. It's my favorite. I love the velocity of it. I love the, uh, it just fits my personality. We have a uh, local wholesaling operation here in the Memphis area called the House Guys. Uh, me and my uh, my partner James, and um, we just have a blast doing it. We we are still involved in the RIA, but we don't run that anymore. Um, I am a father of two beautiful redheads. You'll see them here shortly, and a beautiful redheaded wife. So it's just me and a bunch of ladies here in the house. And uh, one of the things I love the most about the life that I get to live is being able to work and be around them here at home. Uh, Anybody who knows me knows I don't leave the house a lot, actually, <laughs> and I like it that way. 
So uh, we probably right now I'd say wholesaling anywhere from three to five houses a month, and uh, I've wholesaled somewhere north of four fifty transactions uh, since getting started. So that's me in a nutshell. Um, let's see, did Brian give us? He said he just said we look like brothers. He didn't say who looked better. Oh well. Come on, Brian. All right, so let's keep going. Got a question for you guys. What is it that first sparked that real estate investing flame? And you know what I'm talking about, that flame inside you that's like, oh, you know, the faith of real estate investing uh, that gets you excited. Um, what was the thing that first sparked that? I just want you to think for a moment about that. Was it that you wanted to jailbreak from your J-O-B? Maybe you were so miserable that you just needed O-U-T of the J-O-B. Was it financial autonomy that you were drawn to and not having your financial future or present dependent upon someone else? Maybe it was just the idea, the, the, the big shiny object of getting rich, getting wealthy, boats, cars, mansions, glitz, glamour, rock star lifestyle. Maybe it's living the high life. Maybe it's uh, bucking the system. Maybe you're wired to be a rebel and uh, just you want to zig when everybody else zags and that led you into real estate. Maybe you're hardwired to be an entrepreneur or a self-employed individual. And, and I'll say if, if you want to go ahead and plug in to the question area, what, what is it do you think that, that really sparked your initial flame um, to dive into real estate? You know, what, what was that? Um, plug it in the uh, questions panel if you'd like, and uh, it would be interesting to see what the common threads are. While you're pondering that, we're going to help you a little bit by sharing uh, what initially sparked us in real estate investing. We've got to go back a few moons to be able to do that. Um, Patrick, I'd like to start with you and have you share that part of your story. First, I feel obligated to acknowledge that though these three pictures of us are many years apart, I'm wearing the exact same shirt in all of them. What? That is crazy. Oh so, <laughs> yeah, that's pretty rad. Of a, of a, of a, I just noticed. Anyway, so I, I do have favorite clothes. That's one of the benefits of, uh, of working from home all the time. So anyway. Buy you, you need to buy you a couple of new shirts. <laughs> um, all right, man. All right. Let's talk about it. What sparked you? Yeah, let me, uh, let me share my, my, my spark. And it, it, it dates back to growing up, really. Um, and as a kid, I remember just seeing the mold that society tries to force you into. Um, to go to school, get a, get a job, work for somebody else, hopefully maybe retire by the time you're 65 or older and then live the good life and have time to do the things that you want. None of that ever made sense. Hmm. Um, I, my parents both, um, uh, one's in healthcare, one's uh, in education, a teacher, um, they've always had jobs, uh, they've been employees, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. But what I, what I saw them, you know, getting up, going to a job, working for someone else, um, having to be somewhere at a specific time, having to ask if they could have time off when they wanted it off, none of that, none of that made sense to me. And I didn't know what else was out there at the time, but... Um, I think it's kind of evidenced in, like my dad has always made fun of me for this over the years, but uh, at some point in time whenever I was growing up, he asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, I want to do odd, odd jobs. <laughs> I don't even know, I don't know what that meant exactly, but I think it's a hint that at the time I was thinking, you know what, I'm going to find something else to do and it's not going to be the typical little mold and I'm not going to be a doctor um, almost became a civil engineer, but veered off course, thankfully. Um, and even like as a, as a kid in school, um, I think I was like sixth grade, um, I started buying boxes of, of candy in bulk and selling them for a profit at school. I'd, uh, if you've ever heard of the candy uh, airheads, I would yeah. buy a box, <laughs> I'd buy a box of airheads and I'd sell them for a quarter a piece. Um, and so I, I think just the, the idea of going out there and, and doing something, making money myself, making my own way was kind of a part of, uh, part of me growing up. But it wasn't until um, 
after my third year at Clemson University, um, I was on break with a couple friends in Charleston. And one of my buddies met a guy in his late 20s. He owned like six rental properties. And each was cash flow, and he said around $200 a month. He talked about appreciation and mortgage pay down. And like we, our eyes were wide open. And mm -hmm. uh, that caused us to venture into uncharted territory, Barnes and Noble. And like I, I never was a reader growing up at all. And the only time I ever read was the cliff notes of whatever book we were supposed to read for school, and I probably read the cliff notes skimming them the day before. Um, but when I, we left the bookstore, one of the books was called like, How to Make Your First Million in Three Years Investing, and the other one had a whatever, without tenants, banks, or rehab projects. Um, but I peeled back the pages, and it spoke to me. Um, for the first time ever, I saw a way out, a way out of the rat race, a way out, a way out of the mold that society tries to put you in. And, um, and, and I mean, to, to, to me, like I just started thinking about the, the time freedom, being able to go and do what I want when I want. Mm -hmm. um, of course, financial freedom and the riches, status, power. Um, at, at first, I was definitely more uh, motivated by things and stuff that the money could buy. Um, but that, that was it for me. Um, that was my spark and that got us, got me started. And shortly, a few months later, um, I had bought my first property and was off to the races. Hmm. Uh, by the way, I just want to say before I share mine, uh, that I'm seeing a lot of really, um, uh, frankly moving responses, uh, in the question box to people who are, answering the question what sparked their interest in real estate investing in the first place and I just want to say I, so how much I appreciate you guys uh, sharing and if you haven't yet we really I'm gonna I'm kinda got one eye on them right now but I'm gonna be reading through all of them individually myself after we get done here as well and I really want to know what sparked you in this I, I love kinda getting inside people's stories a little bit so thank you for what you guys have shared so far in there please keep it coming so well, what sparked me um, I mean, I kind of hinted at it a minute ago that um, the major turning point was when I read a book by Robert Kiyosaki called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Maybe you've heard of it. I don't know. It is rather well known. Uh, I'm not a, like a big Robert Kiyosaki groupie. Uh, I, there's some things about you know, kind of what his organization has done lately that I'm not a fan of, but uh, those two first books... Uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and the Cash Flow Quadrant are, sh should be on everyone's bookshelf. The ideas in those two books just, just blew my mind at the time. And it spoke to me at a level that stirred something that had always been inside of me but had been untamed. And, and I wasn't really even sure what it was. Uh, it goes back to the way I was raised. My dad was, he didn't have a regular job. He was an artist, a painter, like painted paintings. Um, and because of that, he always worked from home. He was, you know, self-employed. Ups and downs, a lot of ups and downs that came along with that. Um, but I think because that's what was modeled for me, I, as I grew and was like, okay, you know, what am I going to be when I grow up? I, I always gravitated towards starting a business or being in some way kind of self-employed. Didn't really know what direction I should go with that, and it led me into a lot of different. Um, trial and error kind of uh, experiments. I did multi-level marketing multiple times. I, I used to be an Excel rep, if anybody knows Excel, uh, long distance company. Um, I tried a lot of different things. I used to do telephone sales from my bedroom, uh, just trying to sell uh, like an information product, just like before the internet, because um, I'm older than I look. Um, but I, I, you know, it's just a, maybe some of you guys can relate to just like, you just hustle, you just know like, I just need to do something it's not just like working at a restaurant or working, you know, at, at sitting in a cubicle. So I always had that kind of energy inside me, but didn't know how to channel it. And once I read Rich Dad Poor Dad and had those ideas to wrap around what was inside me, I I thought, well, this guy got started in real estate, so I'll get started in real estate. Then maybe I'll like sell Velcro wallets like he did or something. So got started in real estate. That was the spark, though. Uh, it was this idea that I can take this, uh, this kind of hardwired entrepreneur slash self-employed person inside me and I can wrap something legitimate around it 
that, uh, that, that really makes sense and, and truly carve this path. Now, um, one of the parts of that story that's maybe important too to understand is my dad, although he was self-employed, we were broke all the time. Um, he'd make a check. He'd, we'd be doing great for a month or two, and then it'd all go away because he was not good at finances, and he was not good at business development. He just did not have business skills. I love my dad a lot, extremely talented artist, but did not know how to build a business. And that's why, to me, uh, today, that's one of the things that I really try to focus a lot on is um, learning the skills of building a business, not just flipping a house. You know, there's two totally different things. Um, that's a different conversation for a different time, but that was my spark. So that's what got me into it. Let's continue. Uh, in the, the next point of the discussion I want to make is uh, the spark that got you into real estate investing versus the flame of the fire in your belly. Uh, a spark starts a flame, right? It's kind of common sense, but it won't keep it going. There are imminent things in your life that threaten to quench that flame inside you. Here's an example of several. And uh, Patrick, would you just kind of, uh, why don't you run through the list here a little bit and, and share some of the things that we've discussed on these. And negative people, they're everywhere. Watch out. Um, and sometimes it's even, it could be the person you love most, which hurts. Um, but negative people are going to, if they haven't yet, they're, they're, there's probably, you're probably going to run into some people who try to tear you down, who tell you, that real estate investing is not going to work for you, that it's a scam, that, that you know you can't do it because of X or Y or Z. They're going to name off any number of reasons. And like I, for, for me, like, like negative people can either just like send you straight out of the game or it can fire you up because you're so pissed you want to prove them wrong. <laughs> and um, there was a guy from my college that after I quit, you know, he was a friend of mine. And every time I ever saw him again, like the, the only thing he wanted to talk about was when was I going to go back to school and get my degree. And, and it just ruined a previously good friendship. And, uh, you know, you're going to deal with other uh, potential flame quenchers, um, overwhelm, your own junk in your head. Um, after my first year investing, uh, one of my partners at the time uh, walked out on us left um, and I was left kind of holding the bag. His responsibilities at the time were financing for our company and so in my head all of a sudden I had all this junk saying you look too young. There's no way you know you can do this and get the money and do what he was doing for us. Limiting um, beliefs. Go ahead. Limiting beliefs. That's all I said. Big time, big time, and 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 one of pro probably the the biggest flame quencher that you're going to have to deal with, right inside of here, um, it you know, and it might be that voice of the negative person that's ringing inside of your head telling you you can't do it, but you know, just press on, take action, surround yourself with positive people, people that are going to bring you up. Um, other flame quenchers, like if a deal goes bad, if a deal falls through, if your financing falls through, you know, life is going to turn sideways sometime. Um, you're going to be distracted. You might be in a little bit of despair, but um, we're going to show you how to make sure that flame keeps on and uh, does not quench and go out. Well, and here's the thing. Here's the Here's the bad news, if you will. When it comes to these uh, flame quenchers, uh, it's really not a matter of if but when. It, it, it is a factor for every single person who is pursuing freedom, fame, and fortune through real estate investing or through any uh, uh, entrepreneurial self-employed endeavor. These things are going to be factors. They are, you are going to face them. It's a sad truth. Your fire, that flame inside you, can burn on its own for a while, but eventually it will flicker out unless you add fuel. And this guy, <laughs> yep. he added a little bit too much fuel. He added a little too much fuel, but the point is the right fuel, as it says at the top, turns a flicker into a gall-dern inferno. 
So what is the right fuel? What what is what does that mean? W H Y. The fuel is your why. It is the reason why that motivates you. So what's a why? I think it's important to understand a why is not just as simple as, you know, well, my family, you know, a snapshot of my kids, this is my why, or, you know, I want to make a lot of money, or, you know, here's some goals. Those are, those are all important. Those have value, but that's not a reason why by my definition or by one I think that's really going to, to help propel you and motivate you the way that a true reason why I will. If you look at the top here of the screen, it's a clear sense of purpose that inspires you to do what you do. It's the power of purpose in your life. It's the fire in your belly that gets you out of bed early in the morning. It keeps you up at night. It's what enables you to tap into those reserves of energy and focus and determination and courage you didn't even know that you had when you need them the most. It's bigger than money. It's bigger than riches, it's bigger than cars or boats or dream vacations or living the real estate lifestyle or the real estate dream, however you define that. Your why, your true why, it moves you up the food chain from being about you to being about something bigger than you. Think about that for a moment. It's about connecting those natural skills and talents that you have with what you're truly passionate about and then focusing yourself like a laser on a mission that deeply resonates and motivates you. So as I was thinking through some of these concepts before we started tonight, I wanted to read um, to kind of fill my thoughts with what some of the other great thinkers in this arena have had to say about uh, motivating why. And I came across this article on Forbes, and I just, uh, there was this one little excerpt you can see highlighted in yellow that really resonated with me, and I wanted to read it to you. I think it's a beautiful word picture that really drives this home. The power of purpose is similar to the energy of light focused through a magnifying glass. Diffused light has little use, but when its energy is concentrated as through a magnifying glass, the same light can set fire to paper. Focus its energy more as with a laser beam, and it has the power to cut through steel. Likewise, a clear sense of purpose, your clear sense of purpose, enables you to focus your efforts on what truly matters most, compelling you to take risks and push forward regardless of odds or obstacles. I hope you can let that soak into the crevices of your mind and your heart for a moment because it is... It is a profound concept and a critical concept because knowing your why is an important mission critical first step in figuring out how to actually achieve the goals that excite you and create a life that you deeply, deeply enjoy versus merely surviving day to day. Only when you know your why can you muster the courage to press on even in the midst of those darkest days and nights to take the risks needed to press ahead to stay motivated when the chips are down, it feels like you're licking the bottom of the ashtray of life. In these moments, only your why can have the power to lift you back up and to move your life into an entirely new, more challenging, more rewarding trajectory. Nietzsche said, he who has a why to live can bear almost any how. Mm. You know, that's a lot of that's a lot of words, a lot of thoughts. Um, I want to make that even clearer by opening up the kimono a little bit with Patrick and I, and we're going to share with you our why, and hopefully that will make tangible some of those somewhat ethereal concepts that we just discussed. So, um, without further ado, Patrick, let me let me hand off to you, and let's talk about how you found your why, and maybe you should introduce uh, the lovely lady on the screen here as well. All right, well, first off, the lovely lady is Carrie Riddle. Yes, that's right. Uh, my new bride, we are pretty fresh. I uh, just recently got married. She is awesome, incredible, unbelievable. I'm very blessed, very, very blessed. So, all right. Um, to tell you how I discovered my why, we've got to rewind the clock a bit and go back in time, um, all the way, way back in 
the end of 2007, um, to paint a picture for you, um, at the time I had over 40 rental houses, a couple apartment buildings, a couple duplexes, um, and at the time property management issues started surfacing. We had seven evictions going on. We had properties sitting there waiting, like renovated and waiting to sell. Properties sitting, you know, renovated, ready to rent, like tons of vacancy plus the evictions. Um, we had like six renovations going on, full-time crews going house to house, a couple of houses waiting to be renovated. Um, in, the, in the last quarter of 2007, I had $847,000 leave uh, my business bank account to get deployed into the business. Scary. Um, the, the business was devouring cash and the market had finally caught up with us and our business model was broken. Mm. Um, it felt like I was the captain of the Titanic and I had just realized at the dead end of 2007 that the ship was going down and it didn't seem like there was it didn't seem like there was any way out um, but, but but let's let's like rewind even you know a little bit before that the years prior coming into that year I mean we're buying and flipping just dozens of houses a year adding rental properties to the portfolio expanding into markets throughout South Carolina um, funding plenty of funding you know closing deals like clockwork on top of the world um, and then 2008 hits and to start off the year I, I cut off my own income and no longer had an income but had a full-time business to run. Um, I started drastically cutting expenses to get as lean and mean as we could and, and focused in on all of the properties that we had under management to get the you know bad tenants out, to get the properties rented out, get what was up for sale sold, to get our renovations that we had on, the docket finished while we had funds left. It wasn't enough and, and not even close. Um, I mean, ha have you ever had a, a stack of bills and had to sort through them to choose which ones to pay? I have, and it is painful. <laughs> I've been there. It's, it's, it's It is. It is. And, like, putting every penny I could get my hands on in the business to do yeah. everything I could to save, uh, like, the first payment that I ended up letting go um, was my personal residence, dream house, on the water in Charleston. Um, uh, I mean, have you ever had that feeling when, when you don't want to check your voicemail or you don't want to check your mailbox because you're scared at what might be in there waiting for you? Like the hardest thing, the hardest thing that I had to do, and that – you know, looking back on it, it was it was the hardest thing, but it was the smartest and best thing that I could have done. I sat down face to face with every single person that I affected, uh, from employees to contractors to all lenders, uh, many of which were friends and family, um, telling them that telling them things that they didn't want to hear, breaking promises. Um, when it comes to money, emotions run high, and letting down the people that you love and care about most sucks. You know, that's the worst. That's that's the bottom. And like that year, like to top it off, I had I was like I played beach volleyball competitively. I got a hernia. It took me out for the whole year. Had surgery. Totaled my Mercedes. My girlfriend moved thousands of miles away, and I got lawsuit papers and opening that up you know just scary and uh, you know having like going through all that and, and even much here in the years past but but being right there in that situation I drew a line in the sand and I said you know what I, I never want others to have to go through 
the same mistakes, make the same mistakes as I have and go through the same pains as I have. And I just made a power decision that I would spread my knowledge, my experience to every single person that I could affect to help them along their path to success, to help shorten their learning curve. And I mean, for, for me, what does it is getting a, a message, an email from somebody saying that they broke through some barrier that they didn't think was possible, that they closed a deal, that they quit their job, that they made it happen. And, and no matter what, you got to understand that you're going to make mistakes, period. You know, everybody does. It's not the mistakes that matter. It's, it's how you react and how you respond to the things that happen in life, not the things that happen. What's important is how you respond to them. And I could never have learned what I had to as a businessman and as a man to be where I'm at today without going through all that I did. But that's it for me. Mm. And I feel privileged to be here and to be able to be to, to have the impact that we do today and, and on into the future. Gonna gonna keep making it happen. Cheers to you, my friend. <sighs> well guys, um, before we turn to uh, to how I discovered my why, uh, I just want to say I saw some of the comments uh, that came in when Patrick was sharing and I know I can tell that that hit home for a lot of you guys. Uh, some of you said, I'm there now, you know, like I got nothing coming in and only stuff going out. Um, I just want to say we can relate. Uh, we are, um, I think a, a lot of what you see from the faces and voices in the real estate investing world um, does an injustice to real life because uh, you see just the hype and the glitz and the glamour of what's possible. And yes, so many amazing things are possible. All of the all of the all of the hype is not really hype, it's real. But Patrick and I both feel like we have to be authentic and vulnerable about the bumps and bruises and scrapes that are a necessary part of everybody's story. Your story, our story, and I think that when you do that, you offer people hope that there's not something wrong with them. The fact that they're not experiencing, you know, an overnight success, uh, whatever that looks like, um, it's part of the journey, and it's part of it's kind of a rite of passage, as as challenging as that may be to hear, to go through some of those dips. If it doesn't happen for you right out of the gate, maybe you experience some fast success a little further down the road. It didn't happen for Patrick right away. It happened further down the road when things came crashing down. Um, it doesn't mean that Patrick shouldn't have got into it. That's part of the story that he has to that has made him who he is today. The successes of today are built upon the failures of yesterday. That is a fact. And that's also a big part of my story and how I discovered my why. So um, my why is, was not a big light bulb moment. It wasn't, uh, unlike yours, Patrick, it wasn't me. Uh, sitting in one place and having one clear thought that kind of, you know, shone a spotlight, shone down from heaven, and now I, I understand my reason why. Uh, it was a process. It was a process for me that has spanned, I would say, probably the better part of the last 15 years. Um, and it was a process of self-discovery, of me uncovering my, my vision and my values. And I want to explain to you what I mean by that. Um, when I say my values, I don't mean, you know, like don't tell lies and don't um, don't be mean to people and <laughs> don't steal. I mean, those are values, but I'm talking about uh, the things inside me that I am uniquely wired to do that really resonate deeply inside me, the things that I'm wired to do. Um, and those values are not something most people know innately, just automatically by default. You, I think you kind of have to go through a process of real life trial and error and self-discovery to even figure out what that is. But when you uncover what, what your values are, you can see where those things point and where those things all point is to one common place and that's your, your vision for your life. So for me, um, if I were to uh, take the culmination of that process I went through and 
and just to bring it to a head and say, what's one thing that is like my my vision, my mission in life? It has become clear to me that it's to make a difference in other people's lives. That is it, to make a difference in people's lives. And that has nothing to do with money. Uh, it does involve money at times, and there's nothing wrong with making a lot of money in the process as often as possible. Uh, but the money is not the emphasis. The values that I discovered about myself along the way that play into that are as follows. These are the things that I, I feel like I'm uniquely wired to do that also uh, hit a, a really high note in my heart. Leading people well, being creative, building value into people's lives, and God and family first. Those four things, leading people well, being creative, building value into people's lives, and God and family first. If I look back at the things in my life that I've been involved in, the things that I have gravitated towards doing, and I look and say, what are all the commonalities in these things that, you know, that, that, that were consistent throughout them? I can pull from those experiences, and, and basically that's a big part of the process of how I assembled what I'm wired to do, what, what values I've been wired with. Uh, if I ask myself what have been my most rewarding, truly deeply rewarding experiences, it's been those that have made the difference, made a difference in people's lives. So um, a big part of that has been me also realizing that when I got into real estate investing, I didn't have any of that clarity. I wasn't running towards a vision. My reason why was very impotent because I wasn't running towards something that I had some clarity of. I was running away from something. And to tell you what I was running away from, I have to go back to talking about my dad. Uh, as I said, he was self-employed and um, we went through some tough times. And as a part of that process, um, my dad uh, illustrated for me not only the benefits of being self-employed and working from home and being able to go to my games and go to you know all the plays that I was in and that kind of thing, but also um, solidified in me that I do not want to put my family through what we went through financially. That instilled in me a fear, a fear of create, recreating that scenario in my family. So when I started to channel this entrepreneurial drive, I wasn't running towards this clear goal. I, was, I knew I was running towards success and financial success and freedom, but those are very fuzzy concepts, and they aren't what keep you up at night. What kept me up at night was the fear of not wanting to recreate the lack that I grew up in, and that had crystal clarity. So when I realized that, I realized that that is not a reason why that's going to be lasting. It's not going to get me through those dark nights. Sorry, there's a train outside. You can probably hear it honking out there not going to wake me up in the morning. It's not going to keep me up late at night. I had to spin that whole thing, uncover what is the, the positive thing that I'm wired to do. What is my reason why that motivates me in a positive way, not that has me running away from something I'm afraid of. And once I uncovered that and changed my perspective, now I have a filter through which everything else in my life goes. If I have a business opportunity, if I have uh, a, a business I want to structure, if I look at the people I want to do business with, I look at Patrick, I look at my partner James and I say are they the types of people that help me to live the kind of life I want to live? Is this opportunity the opportunity that's going to take me closer to or farther away from my vision of making a difference in people's lives? And is it or is it not congruent with these values that I have established are non-negotiable because I'm wired this way? So that process is a long process, and it took me way too long to explain it. But uncovering your reason why may not be like that. But it does need to be uniquely yours. And it should not be something as simple as money or family or freedom. Because while those are noble concepts, and they certainly are a piece of the puzzle, they are not the puzzle. You have to assemble the puzzle of your reason why. And it may be a process for you. And maybe those are sparks to the flame. You yes, know? yes, um, well said. Why don't you show them your fancy uh, How JP Found His Why uh, slide that we're missing out on here. Oh, I totally, yeah, I forgot. Okay, sorry. That's uh, that's the JP slide, um, and that's there my lovely go. wife there, Cara, on the, on the left, and uh, my family, the rest of them over there on the right. Uh, picture's a couple years old now, but Alyssa is our oldest. She's 14, and Kelsey is 8. All redheads. I'm the only non-ginger in the household.
Maybe you should go red. I got a little in the beard, like hiding behind the gray. I got some red in there. <laughs> well, guys, I hope that um, just hearing uh, how we uncovered our why, um, I hope that hearing that may help you in your journey to doing this. But it is critical that you do this. This is not a, a, a negotiable thing because you will not last in this or any entrepreneurial journey unless you know your why. Um, understand your why is not the same as goal setting. Okay, Goals are fine. Goals are important. Goals are, are, are critical, but they are a vehicle to get you where you're trying to go. Your why is the fuel in the tank of that vehicle. Okay. I also want you to understand money, it's just a tool, it's a means to an end, okay? It's valuable, it's great, it's fun, but it really isn't a, a why. Freedom, as I said, it's just too fuzzy, and it varies widely in definition, even not just person to person, but stage of life to stage of life. And to say that my family is my why, guys, that's just too easy and too darn sappy, so you could try harder than that and do better, I'm sure. <laughs> By the way, this picture over here on the... Uh, on the right of the screen is uh, us actually uh, at Patrick and Carrie's wedding recently. Woohoo! Yeah, that was a recent one. That's a place in Mount Pleasant called Five Loaves. That is delicious. Yes, highly recommend Five Loaves to those of you who ever make your way out to the uh, out to the the Charleston area. Understand that a crisp, clear why is by far the most potent, and that's part of the reason I shared that in my story of how fuzzy my why was in the positive way, but how crisp and clear the negative side of it was until I spun that around and gained clarity. Your why is a clear sense of purpose that inspires you to do what you do. And so, like I love, go well, ahead. I, I loved how whenever you explained your why that you're able to use it as a filter for decision making mm -hmm. because as an entrepreneur opportunities are going to come at you left and right and from all over outside of real estate investing and inside of it and it's easy to get distracted a lot of times with entrepreneurs you know we're wired to seek the new the fresh and um, yeah, just uh, if you can use your why, like JP explained there, as a filter for decision making, it's going to help you make sure, it's going to help you say no to the things that aren't going to move you closer to your vision and where you want to end up. And it's going to make sure you say yes to the right right things. Because um, so even like JP, part of your story, like getting started as a landlord, you know, and quickly realizing that that was an anti lifestyle choice for you. It just, was not, you know, was not a match. Um, that's just powerful. Well, and, and actually, I'll correct you because it wasn't, it, it wasn't quickly. <laughs> it took me too long to, to discover that because at that point, I didn't have those filters in place. I didn't have a clear vision. I didn't understand my values. And so while I knew real estate investing was a powerful vehicle, I just like picked somebody's template and ran with it without really having a filter to put it through. Had I had a better understanding of my unique values, of my reason why, I wouldn't have gotten into rentals because it doesn't match up with those things. And I'm not saying rentals are bad. You know that this is my why. This is these are my values. So I, I wish I had had that back then. So it would have made things a heck of a lot less painful. So you need to force yourself to paint a very specific, tangible picture. And here is uh, here's a, here's a, a one way you can do that. Ask yourself this question, and, and this is actually, uh, uh, I'm going to give you um, some challenges here that I want you to actually follow through on. Not right here because we're just going to keep going, but maybe you could write these down, make a note of this because, you know, if you can do this either tonight before your head hits the pillow or first thing in the morning while it's fresh, I think it's going to be the most meaningful to you. Ask yourself, what is it? What is it that truly inspires me and makes me come alive? And li like I did, look back at all the things that you've ever been involved in, all the th maybe things you've done with your church, if you go to church, things that you've, you know, uh, uh, projects you've been involved in, even hobbies that you've been in, that you've been involved in. What are the commonalities? What are those things that, when you do them, when you're involved in them, it's almost as if time stands still. The word inspire itself comes from the Latin meaning to breathe life into. 
And uh, here's another tool that I think may help you in this process of uncovering your own why. I want you to, as morbid as it may sound, imagine that you're on your deathbed. Okay? On your deathbed, what would you truly regret the most not having done? What would you truly regret the most not having done? And what would you, what would you be the most proud or the proudest of all to have actually achieved? What would you want your friends and family to say about you at your eulogy? Would you want them to say, "Man, he was he he had a lot of a uh, lot of a lot business. of money." Yeah, he had a lot of money. <laughs> or sure you know, wasn't. <laughs> I can tell you, those things are probably not coming to the top of your mind if you're really thinking through those questions. And uh, these can be these can bring you clues as to what your real, true why is. Finally, last but not least, I want you to get real. I want you to get clear, and I want you to put it in writing. I want you to view and tweak it regularly. It needs to be in front of you. I want you to understand this. Your why is intrinsically tied to your values. That's why I brought that up earlier. Now, I've talked about my values, the ones that are unique inside me. Not that you may not have some of the same values, but I want to also talk about some of the synchronous values that Patrick and I share. And actually, Patrick, I'd like to ask you to kind of bump through these a little bit. Um, we, you know, we're, we're in business together, uh, Patrick and I, and we have a lot of projects that we work on, and we're actually going to talk about one of those here in just a moment. But uh, part of that process for us is, um, the part of the real fun of it was realizing how synchronized many of our values are and uh, just kind of how we're made of a lot of the same stuff. So um, I think that as Patrick goes through this with you briefly, I want to ask you to see um, which of these you identify with, which of these resonate with you. A lot of these are self-explanatory, but always care, always have fun. Um, if you've been around here for a while with us uh, on our list or a part of the family in any of the various training programs that we've come out over the years, you know that we're about having fun. And, you know, we're, we're not your serious, stodgy, old, saggy, we were, <laughs> although I'm getting a little older and saggier, I will admit, but yeah. But we're, we're always going to have fun, lighthearted, and just keep it real, like the next, next value there. Um, as you've probably seen tonight, you know, we're, we're here to tell the good, the bad, and the ugly. We've had wins, we've had huge losses, and we've had even bigger wins. Um, it's just about always getting up when you get knocked down and keep moving forward. Um, always have an abundance mindset. Like I, I've made so much more money by working cooperatively with investors than in a competitive manner. Um, you know, just open your mind. Like, like I mean, you're either going to be thinking one way or the other, where you feel like there's an abundance of deals and there's enough for everyone and that you can share and have more by working together, or you're going to think the opposite, that there's a limited amount and there's a scarce supply, and if, and if he gets that deal, that's one less that you can have. Um, I invite you to open your mind to the fact that there's enough out there for everybody. Um, there is. And you're going to make so much more money. You're going to be so much happier when you realize that there's an abundance out there and, uh, and, and really tap, start to tap into that as an investor. And, you know, you may have some value in your business. You may be marketing for lease option leads, buyer leads, and have a pile of them over here that you're not using and be able to fill some of other investors' properties with those leads or vice versa. You know, you can wholesale back and forth. Maybe you can lend money to an investor, and there's just so many ways that you can work together. It doesn't have to be competitive. It can be cooperative. Um, always be students, not just teachers. Um, like in my car lately, I've been listening to, like, nothing but podcasts. In the shower in the morning, I'm listening to podcasts. I'm back Total on a podcast junkie lately. Yeah, Total podcast. I'm back on a on a reading tear. I just finished Ready, Fire, Aim, Smart Cuts. I just tore open a book called The Boron Letters, and I've got like three more books in the mail. 
Um, this this weekend, I'm flying out to San Diego for a mastermind meeting, and I'm going to be there with some investors and some entrepreneurs who are way ahead of me in business, and are going to stretch me to think bigger and act bigger. You know, just always just realize that no matter how far along you get, there's always more to learn, and not just of being a student, be a teacher. And this, even if you're a newbie, like share what you're learning and what you love with others. And you know, just because you're not an expert, you know, at this certain status, doesn't mean that you can't also be in that teacher role as well. Always keep improving, learning, and growing. If you're not growing, you are shrinking. You're decaying. You're withering away. Um, there's so many ways that you can just easily keep on that edge of improving, learning, growing. Um, next up, always be grateful. And here is the kicker, not just for the good stuff. Um, it took me a while to get to the point where I am now, where I am grateful for all of the struggles and tough times that I went through in the market shifted and uh, you know went through everything that can happen bad in real estate did foreclosure judgments lawsuits it was it was nasty it was ugly um, but you know what I'm grateful for it because I'm a better businessman and man because of it yes uh, and You're speaking like, my love language here man you really are I I, I didn't get into I, that part I, of my I story challenge, I challenge you there's something in your life that 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 every time you think about it you 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 put yourself in a negative state, um, and you probably have a lot of anger and resentment towards it. But I invite you to a different perspective. Give thanks for it. It showed up in your life. It's there for a reason. Here it, it showed up. It's there. Um, give thanks for it because it's made you into. The, because especially also on further down, learning from your mistakes. The only way you can learn from your mistakes is if you take some responsibility. And by taking responsibility, like you can you can be grateful for everything that shows up in your life. You can take responsibility for what's there, learn from your mistakes and not have to repeat them again. Who wants to repeat mistakes again? Because insanity has been said to repeat the same mistakes over and over and expecting a different result. Um, you've got to learn from those mistakes. Um, others here always have positive impact and build people up. It's easy to tear people down. People do it every day. And, and I mean, even like judgments inside your head, it's hard to, you know, sometimes just put those aside. But like just be on the other end of the spectrum. Actually be someone who builds people up instead. I mean, so much of what everyone hears and sees just tears down. You know, be a counteractive force. Be, you know, join join us, and and uh, we can do some great things together with that. Always respect people enough to be honest. Telling the truth, being honest, makes things a lot, heck of a lot easier, um, as you will find. Uh, always give first. Give first. Like instead of asking somebody for something from them, you know, just find ways where you can add value to to their business, to their life, based on what their goals and needs are. Um, and always be awesome. Okay? That is quite important. Always be awesome. Always be awesome. So, guys, these are some of the values that uh, we have identified that we are synchronous with, that we share together. And uh, probably you can identify uh, with more than a few of those. These common values have led us to be involved in things together over the years. We uh, we were blogging at the same time, right? Both you and I had real estate investor blogs starting back in like 2008, 2007. Yeah. And uh, uh, we actually engaged in some battle of the blog uh, a few times. And uh, that was your home turf. You hosted the battle of the blog, but who has two thumbs and one? You didn't win. You, you didn't win. I beat you. <laughs> I just that's all that matters is I beat you. But we've been involved in a lot of uh, a lot of really fun, exciting things. We've we've uh, trained and coached people together. Um, but this leads us to an awesome friendship, bros since '08. An awesome new startup venture together, which we're about to let the cat out of the bag on. That amplifies.
our core values, which we just laid out for you, and it takes our why to a whole new level. And we are so excited. And it is called drum roll. Drum roll. And I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna do another toast to the official launch. Boom. Uh, Awesome REI. Woo! Woo! Yeah. And the crowd goes, well, I know I can I can hear you guys like in the background, I can hear you all clapping and oohs and ahs. Awesome REI, real estate investing for awesome people. For awesome people. And That's right. uh, any of you who have been around since the beginning of, of Private Money Blueprint, um, Private Money Blueprint is now Awesome REI. That's right. Um, that is the new company that we are operating out of, and we're going to give you a look, see at some pure awesome that we have coming down the pipeline for you. So I'm going to hop uh, out of the presentation and just go to the interwebs. Uh, you can see, bam, here it is, awesomerei.com. Now what I want to do is just take a moment. We're not going to take a real long time, but before we get to the Q and A. I hope you guys are ready to grill us with questions. I want to very briefly let you know what this is, but more importantly, W-I-I-F-M. What's in it for me? Or I guess it would be W-I-I-F-Y. What's, <laughs> what's in it for you? Uh, I, want, I just want you to understand um, this is a major shift for us. Um, we've explained to you that our values and our vision and our why, a huge part of that, I sounded like Donald Trump there, huge part of that is pouring value into people's lives. It's walking alongside our fellow real estate investors and helping them in their journey, helping shorten your learning curve, helping uh, teach you from the you know 28 years of experience that we share between the two of us and that's what this is. It's almost like a ministry to the two of us. So um, real quickly, let me just give you a little snapshot to whet your appetite. Um, as you can see, here we are on the home page. And I'm just going to zoom in a little bit so we can get this real clear in case people are on a small monitor. Um, you can see real estate investing for awesome people. But these two paragraphs, I'm just going to read through these because I want you to grasp this and I want you to hear it from my own mouth. Money, freedom, and fun through real estate without the infomercial aftertaste. It is far too common for real estate investors to struggle, to wander after shiny objects, let fear hold you hostage, or just fizzle out. Our mission here is to help you stop doing that and be awesome instead. We are not infomercial guys. I think you've identified that. You're not going to get anybody drinking beer on an infomercial unless they're selling beer. We, <laughs> we're not nearly that polished. You won't find us offering free seminars in hotel rooms. We are just real life, actual human beings, not action figures. We care about you. We actually care about your success. We are willing to let you learn from our wins, but also and equally as importantly, our losses so that you can shorten your learning curve in the process. So if you're new to real estate, we believe in you. We want to walk with you. We don't want you to quit. You can do this. If you're experienced, we got a few tricks up our sleeve we want to share with you. We want to help you crank things up to the next level. If you want to grow your business, if you want to do more deals, if you want to make more money and strive towards freedom, expand your mind, have hopefully piles of fun in the process because in case you can't tell, we like to have fun, and be generally awesomer, then you're in the right place. Awesome REI. That is basically a statement of culture for us. Anything you want to add to that, Patrick, before I uh, scroll down the page a bit? No. Nah, scroll on, brother. Okay. So uh, if I scroll down here just a little bit, there's one more thing I want to point out to you. Um, the What can we help you with today? Those are just uh, links to some of our uh, training programs that we have already previously that exist. I want to blow past that and show you uh, most recent knowledge bombs. Boom. So, Boom, knowledge bomb. So let me just explain to you what a knowledge bomb is and, and why I think this is going to be exciting to you if you, uh, if you accept our invitation and travel along with us through this awesome REI experience. Um, Patrick, what, would you, what words would you put to that? What would you say a knowledge bomb? How would you, how would you differentiate a knowledge bomb from 
you know, a blog post, for, for example? I'll tell you what it's not. It's not just your normal article. It's not your normal blog post. It is in-depth. It is meaty. It is actionable. Awesomeness. So you guys know, uh, we've said, we come from a, a history of blogging. Both of us like to express and share. Um, my blog was REI Tips, yours was Must Know Investing, and then, you know, those are, no, no sorry, the train's going by again. I don't know if you can hear that. <laughs> ah, it's all good, barely. Um, so we thought, as we were putting this project together, we want to be able to share freely of the ideas that we have currently from our real estate investing businesses, what we're learning even now in real time, but also just the wealth of what we've assembled in knowledge from our years in the trenches, as well as what we've learned from uh, the people who poured into us, into our lives, and whose shoulders we're standing upon. But rather than just do another, you know, another blog with blog posts, you know, when I think of a blog post, it's typically like, well, you know, here's a tip on this thing that I learned, and then here's, you know, here's here's a tip on yellow letters that I learned, and uh, here's a deal I recently did that has a cool story attached to it, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But we wanted to really do something more that's going to give you guys uh, a much richer experience and a much uh, bigger value each time. And that's where this idea of knowledge bombs came from. I'm not going to dig into any of these right now, but I just want to let you know, already we have we some there for, for you to dig into. Yes, we want you to dig into them. Um, we do. So head on over to Awesome REI after the call and uh, dive in. You know, Leave a comment. Let us know what you think. We, I, would uh, encourage you, I would encourage you to start with this first one on the right. It says, time for something awesome. Um, this just kind of sets the stage for everything else, and that's the only one that I would say is not a true knowledge bomb because it's kind of like the foundation under the house, right? Um, I think it's a great place to start, though. Uh, from there, you can see we've got uh, 33 ways to build a ridiculous cash buyers list. I'm going to tell you right now, when we got done putting that together, I was like, Patrick, put this out there because we could sell this thing, but we're not. We're giving it to you because that's our culture now. It's knowledge bombs. Boom! Knowledge bomb in your face. 33 ways. That's, this, is, this is the last thing you will ever need to consume about how to build a cash buyer's list for your wholesaling business. I can tell you that right now. Uh, 47 awesomest MLS keywords for real estate investors and much more to come. That, this is just a starter. Uh, a taste of what's ahead in terms of the knowledge bombs that we have cooking. You guys don't know this, but I literally have I, have, I have a different business outside of my real estate business, and I have a whole team of people who are at work taking our ideas and massaging them into knowledge bombs. So uh, exciting, exciting stuff coming. This is your taste. I want, I want to cordially invite you guys to, at your leisure, begin to make your way through these. Give us feedback. Give us input. We are listening. We are reading every comment. And we are excited to to just make this everything we possibly can for you guys uh, because, you know, it's a little selfish. It matches our values. It matches our reason why, and it scratches that itch for us. Well, when it, and it not only matches our why, but it also is, like, it's it's what we've learned or, or what we feel that, that, uh, that would serve you best. Um, I mean, we've, we've been both uh, actively teaching, training um, on the education side of real estate for a number of years. And uh, this is what we feel like can take things to the next level. Um, this is what we're bringing you here. So I think when you land on the site, you're going to see it's a little different. It's probably not going to seem like your normal real estate website, but um, that's okay. Okay. One of the things I want to make sure you also, if you're interested in this, if you'd like to know a little bit more about um, the team of people who are going to be helping to to make this happen for you, uh, up here at the top you can see the navigation, uh, what is this link right here? Uh, that's kind of like our About You page, and I guarantee if you take a little time and, and look through that, you're going to smile and maybe LOL a couple times. Um, but scrolling down, uh, you see this section in blue that says Meet Team Awesome? If you want to I mean, if you want to get to know Patrick a little better or me, you can you can toggle these and you can actually you can read a little bit more about Patrick and who he is, but who cares about that? There's me. You can read about me. But even more importantly, 
Charity Acres. Charity is our chief membership experience gal, and those of you who've been around with us for a while, you know we put a lot of emphasis in quality support for any of the trainings that we've ever done, for any of the programs, even just for the blog, and Charity is our front line of defense. She is an amazing gal, and she uh, oozes customer support. She is so good at what she does, so if you ever reach out to us, uh, chances are Charity is going to be the first person that you talk to, and um, man, she just is a champion. She is a champion for you guys. Uh, she, she's the one making sure that questions don't fall through the cracks. She's the one making sure that every single person uh, gets taken care of in the way that they need to be get uh, taken care of. And she is a baking ninja. I'm not going to lie. True. I've seen it. Tim Krulia, he is our, uh, our numbers cruncher guy. He's the one who uh, looks at the numbers so that we don't have to sweat him so much. He's super good at what he does. The man can eat Excel spreadsheets for lunch, and he definitely digs tater tots. And uh, David Eldred, uh, you may never, ever hear from David because he's very <laughs> much behind the scenes. Uh, he, I think he likes it that way too, but he is our uh, operations underlord, and uh, <laughs> he's a super awesome guy too. So um, this, we're going to continue expanding the team. We actually have a, another person uh, that we're going to be hiring soon to help Charity with support, uh, but we, we want to be open about who we are, about who's behind the scenes. We're not hiding behind... Uh, a website or um, a smoke screen of any sort because uh, we're very community focused, community minded, and we want you to know who we are and what we're about um, all the way. Uh, you may notice also further down on this page, uh, the, if these look familiar, these, uh, these are our 12 always do's under the what do we stand for uh, section. Those are all the values that we just went through that we have synchronous values. Uh, you may also want to check out the 11 always don'ts and the 10 awesomes, uh, even Chuck Norris approves of the 10 awesomes, as you can, as you can see. Uh, among the 11 always don'ts, one of my favorites is definitely don't put baby in a corner. Uh, so I'll just leave you guys to come back and, uh, and check that out. At your if you aren't leisure. familiar with internet memes, then some stuff might fly by you. Yeah. That's okay. Um, I'm not. I'm, one thing this is not going to be is boring. So you may not always get the jokes that we put up, you, uh, and I don't care really. I, they're more for me than they are for you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, having said that, let's see. Is there anything else? Um, oh, I, just, I want you to know. Also, you can reach out to us um, on the contact us page. You see, you got a little Bill Murray action. Who's awesome? You're awesome. Who's awesome? You're awesome. Who's awesome? You're awesome. If you guys. <laughs> If you guys need to reach out to us, um, we're accessible. Uh, you can reach out to us through here. Again, Charity's our first line, and then she connects with us um, with whatever we need to we need to look at or talk to her about or talk or, or respond to. And, so, and, and 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 going forward, you know what was Private Money Blueprint LLC is awesome R E I, and awesome so R -E -I. bam. So all of, uh, all of the awesomeness that many of you are familiar with from the Private Money Blueprint Home Study Course, Private Money on Demand, Investor Profits on Demand, 10-Hour Wholesaler, you name it, um, it's all under the umbrella here of Awesome REI, and we're just excited to uh, unveil this. This is, this is so, I mean, it, it may not look like it, but so much time and thought and work went into this, and... Man, you're the first to know. Yeah. You guys. This yeah. is it. This is a labor of love, truly. We haven't, we haven't posted on social media. We haven't done anything. We haven't emailed our our list. You're you are the first ones to know about this and and I feel awesome for you to be here to share it. Makes me okay, feel all so We're gonna jump into some Q and A. We wanna answer your questions, but first, two more things. One, I wanna remind you guys, whoops. Sorry, I shouldn't have started at the beginning. I was trying to bring up a couple of slides. Current slide. Uh, I want to remind you guys of what's ahead tomorrow night and Thursday night. Okay. Real estate investors essential life cycle. The five major milestones every real estate investor must face in your career. The two major linchpins of your awesome success or Oh, your epic failure. Sorry about that. <laughs> it's oh. your I was sending a message to, to, to one of our questions. Sorry. <laughs> Real estate investors, biggest obstacles uh, that most newer investors face and how to obliterate them. 
Uh, we're going to talk about the tactical trap that everybody falls into and how you can avoid it and the three axioms of awesome. Final quote, going back to our theme for the night. Ooh, this one, this great, one will slap you across the face. It will. There are two great days in a person's life. The day we are born and the day we discover why. All right, so let's jump into some Q&A, shall we? Um, Look, we see all of you guys and gals. You're, you're there, so it's now time to ask us what's on your mind. It doesn't matter if it's totally unrelated to what is at hand here. Um, you can ask us clarifying questions to get to your why. If you've got a deal on your plate and you need some, uh, some guys like us to run it by, um, if you've got a funding question, whatever it may be, just hit us with it. And um, JP, I'll let you I'll let you tackle one I saw here um, from Ulf, um, who asked. He said, "At this time, I am interested in virtual wholesaling only. Uh, does this animal exist?" Okay, virtual wholesaling. So uh, yes, it does. Uh, and for those who don't know, virtual wholesaling is kind of a buzzword that uh, was uh, first started by our mutual friend Chris Chico, uh, and it it basically is another word for remote wholesaling or wholesaling in an area that's outside of the area that you live in. Uh, it absolutely exists. Uh, there's there's no reason you can't do it. It is a slightly different uh, approach than a lot of wholesalers are used to. Um, but it certainly can happen. Um, I know a lot of guys who do it, who do very well with it. Um, I do think that I want to give you a bit of a caution, though, Ulf, and I don't know your situation. I don't know your, uh, your story or your experiences or why you are interested in virtual instead of local. But a lot of people have a limiting belief that wholesaling won't work in their market, and so they start looking at the grass that's greener on the other side. And uh, I tend to recommend to people that unless you don't see other people wholesaling in your market, that maybe you try it in your market first because you do have a little bit lower barrier of entry in, in a few ways, um, in my view. Uh, one of the signs of uh, that your market might not be the best for wholesaling, though, would be if you research, you look around in Google, you look around for a RIA group, and you basically see zero wholesalers. If there's no competition, then that may be a sign. It's not necessarily a, a surefire sign, but it, it's a possibility that you might be in an area where wholesaling is, is more challenging. So anything to add to that, buddy? No, that's good stuff. I mean, it can definitely, you, you can definitely make it happen. Like, I'm a fan. I like doing deals <clears throat> that are within arms reach, you know, within 30 minutes-ish around Charleston. However, um, for a little while, wholesaled a couple deals out in Phoenix, Arizona, back when the market was just smoking hot. Um, and I'm a fan when doing that, when doing out-of-market flipping. I like having some legs on the ground. So uh, a buddy of ours out there, this guy Shane, he was our legs on the ground to go scout out properties and to line stuff up and you know get a repair estimate done. Um, and it may not, it's not necessary to have legs on the ground, but I just mentioned it that I like, I enjoy that, and that's how I've done a little virtual wholesaling myself. I think it's what I think is the best way to do it, to have somebody who, um, you know, whether it's a, through a co-wholesale arrangement or, or whatever it is, to have somebody who can be those legs on the ground. It's not hard to find somebody who's willing to do that if you bring the lead to the table. So, yeah. <laughs> All right, the questions are just piling in. Um, I'll take this next one here. I see one from Susan Benting. Susan, it's awesome to have you on. She just asked, uh, does the link to work to get into 10-hour wholesaler, uh, the program, um, does it still work or do we go to Awesome REI? Good question. Um, at, at a point in the future, we do plan on having a member login through Awesome REI and transitioning to serving up our training programs here in this new home, but it's not going to be for a little while. And all the logins for any of the various training programs still work. You'll still be able to access them the way that you have been. Um, I saw another email in here 
from a fellow, I can't, I don't see it now, but he asked if he would still have access to private money blueprint, which I guess he purchased in the past, and yes, any, any programs, products that you've purchased from us still have access to, still access them where they are currently. At some point in the future, we will be moving them over to Awesome REI. Okay. Um, what information should I give a private lender applying first-time personal, like name, address, social security number, besides property info? Not sure I understand. Should I give private lender applying first-time personal? Well, I, I think it's just what information should he give a private lender applying for a loan for the first time, um, besides property info. Okay. I, I would assume, and I'll, I'll jump on this. Um, good, good question. Like with private lending, the private lenders that I work with and teach students to work with are asset-based lenders, meaning the property is the collateral and the asset to the loan, not you, the person. Um, so, like with with private private lenders, I don't. I never gave them a social security number ever. I've never provided a private lender with a credit report, a financial statement. It's always been about the specific deal itself, uh, the the property, and, and the fact that it is the collateral and security for the loan. And so, so I would suggest, like I have a, a private lending PowerPoint presentation um, that's available for free. If you don't have it, it's a simple template where you can fill it out and use that to sit down with a potential private lender to just walk them through it. Um, if you don't have that yet, just email our support or send a message through the reach out area, Awesome REI, and we'll send you that. But basically that will help you understand what I've found is the most effective process with a private lender. Um, use that presentation. That's going to give the lender all the information you need and also allow you to collect the info you need. And it doesn't have anything to do with giving them personal information like your social credit score, any of that stuff. Patrick, I have another question here. Uh, this is from Brian Bruning. He says, I'm 36 years old. Is it too late for me to get into investing? I paid for a school called Renatus, but feel lost with what's out there. What should be my next option to get my investing going? Well, I'll say right off the bat, Brian, everybody who is uh, 40 and over just got very offended that you would even ask that question. <laughs> well, no, it's, it's, it's definitely not too late. Uh, I mean, not, not even close. I mean, we, we, we've got students who are, who are 60s, 70s, and on up. Um, from there, and it's never too late. You can get out there and make it happen. I used to have a limiting belief that I was too young um, and that I looked too young. When I was, whenever I was 23, the first full year of investing, I, I seriously looked like I was 15. If that, I had long hair, and I was like on a mission to prove my dad wrong that I could flip some houses even with my long hair and I wasn't even going to cut it until I closed a few deals and proved them wrong. Like um, old, young, doesn't matter. You can make it happen. Um, I haven't heard of Renatus, so I'm not sure what kind of school that is. Um, but start out like just soaking up as much information as possible about the different strategies with real estate and different business models and you want to figure out what per your goals, your dreams, your why, what what business model and what niche of properties that you want to focus on. That's that's the that's the biggest thing that if you can figure out early on, that's going to hone all of your study time and action time down to a specific business model and method. Um, and so I would suggest soaking up information on wholesaling, fixing and flipping, you know, rentals, and then deciding, okay, you know, this is my strategy that I'm going to move forward with and uh, just focus in so that you know what kind of information, knowledge, and whatnot that you can seek out for. I want to say this to uh, Brian, what you're going through, that, that kind of sense of overwhelm and like a deer in the headlights combined with a lost sheep, 
uh, that is so normal, and it is so um, you are in such good company to go through that. It's it's kind of a uh, a, a rite of passage your first year, if you will, uh, to go through that smoke screen, that cloud of uncertainty and like, you know, first something sparks you, right? You get sparked into real estate investing and you're like, hot dog, real estate investing is where it's at. And then and then you get into it and like you, you find yourself subscribed to email lists and you're like, whoa, you know, I just got into thinking about this thing. I saw flip this house and now I see this thing called wholesaling. Well, that looks pretty good. And then you're like, whoa, what is, what is what are lease options? That's, whoa, I can do this kind of thing. What, what the heck is a contract for deed? And the rabbit hole just gets deeper and wider and deeper and wider and deeper and wider. And, and before you know it, you're like, ah, I got to do two. This is too stressful. Subject twos and flex options and, you know. Yeah, yeah. And that is that is a normal part of the process, okay? Um, your mission is to not nail it right out of the gate. Your mission is to try and figure out, try and absorb enough information without the pressure to get it right even the first time, absorb enough information about what's out there to try and find a niche that you think is the best fit, as best you can tell, you won't know for sure until you try it, but the best fit for your personality, for your likes and dislikes, for your market that you're in. Um, you can't necessarily make that determination based on a video sales letter or a presentation that somebody makes about their training program because while their training program is very good, you know what you're looking at is designed to to promote that material, including ours. But um, you you do have to do your best to look inside yourself and look outside yourself and say, what do I think is maybe the best place for me to start in this real estate investing space? And invest a little bit of money in, in learning about how to do that. Go buy, go to the library and get some books and read on it. Um, invest, you know, maybe a hundred bucks to three hundred bucks in a training program, and then go out there and start to get your feet wet. Don't go out and spend ten grand or five grand or twenty grand on a training program or a big event or something when you don't even know for sure what type of investor you're going to be yet because you're just you're likely blowing your money. Um, all, that's why we talk about the free hotel uh, trainings that occur. You know, we know a lot of the guys actually that put those on, and I just think it does a disjust, uh, an injustice to investors um, by uh, setting an expectation when they don't even know if they want to be a wholesaler or a rehabber yet because you have to have a little bit of trial by fire. So once you start down that road, you may discover – you know, give yourself six months and you may go, ah, this isn't right for me because, you know what, I, I thought I wanted passive income through rentals, but it turns out I kind of hate dealing with tenants. Like, I'd rather stick hot pokers in my eyes than deal with tenants. That's how I feel. So if you discover that and you're like, man, this is really not a good fit for my personality, uh, that's normal too. You pull out and you go and you try something else. It, it's not about the individual tactic or strategy and nailing it right out of the gate. It's about the bigger picture of what real estate can accomplish and how that matches with your goals and your vision. You don't have to get it right right out of the gate. Just keep moving forward. Just try a little bit. Try a little bit of something else. When you find that sweet spot, though, you put blinders on and you hunker down and you focus on doing that thing and nothing else and you do the crap out of that thing and then and, and you don't keep going wide, you go deep, an inch wide and a mile deep instead. So that's the process that you're in. I know this is probably hitting home for a lot of people who who identify with those feelings and being a part of that process, but I just want you to know it's normal. Don't be super stressed out about it. Just go through it. I've been through it, Patrick. I'm sure you went through some version of that. Well, uh, yeah, for sure, and there's a, there's a couple. I mean, yeah, we've got a lot of questions in here, and we'll try to rapid fire some off here. Um, there's a couple more, one from Sherry asking first step to get a deal started, um, another one from Queen who says, I am a complete newbie, never done deal, what to do first. Um, so in, in addition to a little bit of what we shared there, a great thing when you're just getting started, go to your local RIA or whatever investment groups are in your area, just start networking and hanging around, getting to know some other active investors in your community. Just being around some movers and shakers, people who are making things happen, doing deals, 
is going to be good for you. You know, go down to the foreclosure auction and just experience it. You know, see what happens. Go buy you a couple books, read some blogs and websites out there, and just start that education process. Start networking, team building. That's some of the best stuff that you can do when getting started. You know, even if it's not specifically you know, marketing to motivated sellers and generating leads and making offers. All right, I'm I'm going back to the top of the list to answer some of those earlier questions because they're they're definitely piling into the bottom here. I'm trying to find the top of the list. Give me a second. While you're finding a uh, Brendan King asked, uh, how do we choose the best business cards as investors? Do they really have to be professional or can they be quirky? Brendan, um, they can be either. Um, I I would uh, I mean a, a lot of more stuff that you'll probably come across is the more professional. Um, but, you know, be yourself and uh, I, I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a big, it has to be a big decision. You can go on to Vistaprint, print out some cards real quick, put your information on there and at least you've got something to hand others as you're networking and getting to know, know them. Okay, uh, did you read Denise Brown's question already? I'm not sure. I'm new to this business and do not know exactly where to start. I've been doing webinars with so many different people. I just feel very confused about which business model to follow. I get your value and I can identify with JP and Patrick. I'd like to come on board with your business model. I do not have any real money to invest. I want to learn this and I will work hard. How do I get started? Have we, we haven't touched on that, have we? Um, no, t t talked about a couple like getting started type questions, not that one specifically. Yeah. I want to say our business model is really not what we're here to sell you tonight. Um, I mean, I like to do wholesaling right now, and occasionally we'll do something outside of that. Um, but that may not be the right fit for you. Um, we can talk about that in a different setting. You know, we we have programs and and training and stuff that have to do with uh, different wholesaling models, but. Um, I just want to say that's not really our message and I don't want you to walk away with that message. In terms of how to get started, um, I want to revert, refer you, I can tell Denise from your question kind of maybe where you are, I want to refer you back to what I said a minute ago uh, about wading through all the, the cloudiness of uncertainty. Um, a lot of people get, I know some of the questions I've seen have been like, man, I'm broke and I got to have money now. How do I get into wholesaling and like make, make get paid as fast as possible? And I don't know, what do you, what's your thought? There's been a few of those types of questions, Patrick. How would you respond to that, that type of question? Well, it's, I mean, I'm, I'm staring at another question from James. Um, lost his job last week, married, son in college, no income. Wants to quickly get into wholesaling. Um, yeah, I, I feel like I don't want to diminish the potential to make quick cash in wholesaling right out of the gate because it exists. It is. It can happen. And in fact, um, I'm, I do not. I don't want you to go pull your credit card out and buy this right now. But we have a program that's probably really tailor made to that, and, and it's our ten-hour wholesaling program um, taught by Justin Wilmot. But, but I think that if you're in a position where like you're better over a barrel and you gotta, you're like broker than broke and you, you're in a bad way and you've got to make money and you're looking at wholesaling as the answer and you don't know how to do it yet, that's just not a, that's not a plan I think that you should stick with. I think that you need to, you're in a position of trauma and triage financially and that's not a good place to make good decisions on deals. You always make the best decision when you don't need the deal, when you don't need the money. And there's nothing wrong with being in need. I understand that I've been there, but if you're in a place of desperation, you're gonna do everything you can to try and make a deal happen, and you're you're just gonna your your judgment's gonna be questionable. So, I would encourage you to look for a a way to get out of the financial triage before you go all in with something like this. Learn, but don't depend upon it to get you out of your emergency. Like maybe maybe find a way, you know, even if you have to work in a job that you don't like, that you think's below you, that at least gives you the income to have something coming in, um, yeah. where you're not a hundred percent reliant on, you know, if you've never done a deal, a new strategy. Um, like having to do a deal to eat is 
is a, is a tough position to be on, you know, especially if you're new. And, it, and it's not that it can't happen. I mean, at any point in time, you can. There's deals out there. There's motivated sellers. There's people who need out. And can you find them? Put them under contract. Close next week and flip the deal. Sure, it can happen. It does happen. Um, but to put yourself in a position where you're relying on making that happen, um, there's probably a couple, uh, a little two-step approach to it, to, to find a way that you can get a reliable sort of income coming in something and then putting the pedal to the metal on the wholesaling side of things. Go back to my story that I shared earlier. You're running from a negative why, and that's not a good place to be. You're... You're, you may be motivated to hustle, but you're hustling out of fear to try and run away from financial pain as opposed to hustling because you have a reason why that's like a beacon of hope that motivates you in a positive way. So that's the place that I think that you need to really dig in your heels and make this happen. And in the meantime, come up with a, um, um, something that isn't as uh, up in the air and unknown as building a business to solve your financial emergency. So there's a number of questions I saw in there, and you know I, that's not the answer you're probably looking for, but that's just the straight answer that I got to give to have a good conscience. And, and I mean to, to to fire away at wholesaling, you know, if you use the 10-hour wholesaler model that Justin Wilmot uses, you network with wholesalers who already have deals under contract that are on a timeline where they have to have a buyer. <clears throat> Focus on networking with those wholesalers who have the deals. Build your cash buyers list, which We've got a post sitting on Awesome REI that's 33 ridiculous ways to build your – or ways to build a ridiculous cash buyer list. Um, just take massive action. Ready or not, jump in, dive in. Um, Brendan King asks uh, uh, basically um, how to choose the best business cards, and do they really have to be professional or quirky? I, 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 t I, I answered that while you were – did. Okay. Yeah. My answer is I don't have business cards. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, did you answer how do you protect yeah. your earnest money when purchasing a bank REO or, for that matter, a property being bought as is? No, you jump on that one. I'm going to grab – I've got another backup beer just in case I needed it. I'm, I'm on my second already. Um, yeah, so uh, protecting your earnest money, um, well, I, I don't do a lot of REO deals anymore. I did for, for quite some time, but that's not where uh, our opportunity market is right now in the area. Um, so let me talk about other deals. On our mom and pop deals where we're going belly to belly with an individual seller, uh, we just don't do earnest money. We just don't put it down. There you go. Yeah, well, this we, is an awesome beer. Sorry. Sculpin. Um, is a big fish on it? Beautiful beer. Yeah, no pluff mud. No pluff mud tonight. I can't get pluff mud out of my system. <laughs> um, yeah, I've moved on to Oktoberfest. Oh, nice. Um, okay, so anyway, back to what I was saying. Um, I don't. We don't do earnest money. We just tell people when we put a contract on a property. We just basically say. Uh, we don't even bring it up. We we just do ten dollars earnest money on the contract, and if they ask us about it at all, belly to belly with sellers, though, not with REOs, right? Yes, yeah, you missed that part, but I said that. Um, if they ask us about it at all, we just simply say, "Hey guys, sorry, we make or not, hey guys." I just say, "Yeah, we make a lot of offers and a lot of houses, put a lot of contracts down. It's not practical for us to to put five hundred dollars or thousand dollars down multiple times a month." So um, most people don't realize that you don't really have to have that on a contract. Um, it's just a formality that it, you know it can exist, but we just don't do it as company policy, and they just go okay. So well, that's just how we accomplish it there. When it comes to REOs, um, um, you're going to have to put earnest money down, and really the only way you protect it is just by having a, a good contingency in your contract for an inspection or financing. One of those two. Um, if you don't have one of those two contingencies, then your, your earnest money's at risk, uh, and that's just the way the game is played. So hey, hopefully that uh, helps. Yeah. Can I take the next one? I got, I got a good one. Go for um, it. Anthony asked, he says, I collect peanuts t-shirts. What does yours say and where did you get it? Boom. Check it out. So, so awesome. It hurts. I felt this would be quite apropos to us letting you in on Awesome REI tonight. 
Most and definitely. I believe my wonderful wife, Carrie, got this gym at Target. Are you at home right now? Or are you at the office? Uh, I'm at the office. Well, show them the mug. What do you mean? The mug. The awesome mug. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Use I've actually been using it a lot lately. I um, used it this morning. Bam. Anyone can be cool, but awesome takes practice. <laughs> Yes, I know awesome is an overused word, but prepare to have it overused times 10 now. All right, so uh, next question, Susan says, do any of you use Podio? Yes, we use Podio. Patrick, you don't currently use Podio, do you? I do not. Okay, we do in our Podio. company. Um, what do you use it for lead, uh, like just lead management for sellers or for buyers or for what? It's, it's, it's a CMS for the whole company right now. Um, everything, contacts for 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 buyers, for everybody, um, it's it's really more than I can explain in a short conversation. But um, I find Podio. I'm glad we're using it, but it is it has a learning curve, and it's not like you can just plug in and like everything is easy and and from the get go, it's it's so customizable. You can do so much with it, but because of that, like it it just has a learning curve. So I do use it. Um, I'm, I may try FreedomSoft again once um, once it relaunches here. Uh, our buddy Rob Swanson has gonna, is gonna, is got a whole huge upgrade to FreedomSoft uh, that he's building into it. It's going to be pretty sweet from the sounds of it. And, uh, and I may give FreedomSoft another try when that time comes. We'll see. Uh, will this be our one-stop real estate investing training company? It's just too many choices when it comes to real estate training companies. Um, I don't know. And when you say one-stop, um, I'm not. We're not. Our vision for this is not necessarily to try and like create create a training program for every type of investing you can do. Um, yeah, there's, there's going to be plenty of subject matters that that we're personally not experts in, um, and at times, if it, you know, just other types of niches and business models that you can foc on, focus on in courses that aren't aren't ours. I mean, I definitely don't see us as a one-stop shop for everyone. No. You know, we're we have. We have a sp just a specific audience, and you know niches of real estate that we excel in are really good at, and and have training programs on. So, um, and we've got friends in the industry as well who are excited to be a part of this with us. Um, Justin Wilmot is an example of that. Justin has a specific model of wholesaling, a specific version of it, and we've um, extracted that out of him and, and and created training around what he does, so that other people can duplicate it. Um, we've got another friend in the industry who I'm not at liberty to talk about yet because we're still in talks with him about it, but um, he has a specialty in the abandoned houses arena, and we are working on um, putting some specific training together to duplicate what he's been able to accomplish with this sweet arena of abandoned houses. So when we put some training out that's going to be like a training program, first of all, it's going to be within reach. You know, we're not looking to sell $10,000 um, books and tapes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so we want to make it, make sure that it's within reach for, for people. But at the same time, um, it needs to meet our standards of quality. And you're going to know exactly what it is and what it isn't. Um, if you look at anything that we offer right now, we try to be very clear what this is and what this isn't and who it's right for and who it's not right for. So I wouldn't say, like you said, Patrick, we're not we're not all things to all people, real estate investing. What we are is we we want everything we do to match our values and our culture, and to have fun and and to be awesome, <laughs> and to be and just to to be kind of weird, maybe keep it a little bit weird too. Um, but but it's about you guys, not about us. It's about our flavor of what we have to offer, provi providing value in your world, right where you are. Okay, uh, if this is a paid program, what's the price? We're not asking you for money for anything. This is not a, just, this is just awesome, REI.com launching. So put your wallet away, Talon. Put it away, I told you. Gosh, Talon, come on. 
<laughs> um, let's see. How easy is it to find reliable people or local firms to assist me in renovating a property? Um, I assume you mean like a general contractor, uh, Mark. Um, the best way to find a general contractor is to ask other investors. So you need to find what those watering holes are locally for other investors. Um, we have a group here that, I, and you. And here's a little tip too. Your RIA group may be too big, right? Sometimes there's not the best networking opportunities. If you have a RIA group that's very uh, uh, lecture focused, um, I love our RIA group. I started our RIA group, but it's not the best place for me to find a contractor necessarily. It just doesn't, the space is not conducive to that uh, every monthly meeting. So um, one of my kind of secret weapons is I work hard to position myself as a center of influence in the local real estate investing space. This is a lesson I learned by starting our local RIA group. I, I, I realized, oh, holy crap, I have gained so much value out of being the guy that started the group, out of um, you know just being visible and being seen and like serving people by running this group. For the first decade of my career, I, could, I think I could say that every deal I had ever done until that point had in some way involved somebody that I knew through the real estate association that I started. So I have continued to take what I learned from that and even now I want to continue to position myself as a center of influence within the local real estate uh, uh, arena. And what one of the ways I did that is I recently started a meetup group. Meetup.com is a place where you can basically anybody can go and find people of a common interest. If you go to meetup.com and look in your area, you'll see a lot of people of, you know, everything from real estate investors meeting in the Shonies down the street to LARPing to, you know, guys who like to drink beer on Thursday nights and watch movies in their garage together uh, and everything in between. So I started a meetup group and uh, is spe specifically, we meet once a month at a pizza joint um, and it's for like two hours and we basically, it's like an extended deal makers networking session. It's for wholesalers and rehabbers only. I made it narrow. Wholesalers and rehabbers only. Uh, you come, you share deals. You, you, we have, you know, this last meeting was basically, what do you guys need? Like, who needs a professional? This guy's like, I need a plumber. And this guy says, okay, here's a plumber that I use that you can use. This guy says, I need a general contractor. Hey, okay, here's somebody that I used recently, had a good experience with. Who, who does hard money locally? Hey, here's three hard money sources. I mean, it's amazing what has come out of these meetings just by being a facilitator. All I'm doing is facilitating this. So I want to hand that to all of you guys as an opportunity to embed yourself, start a meetup group around a subsection that you're right in the center of and facilitate the whole thing. Remember we said give first is one of our core values. This is an opportunity for you to give first to the community. And you know what happens? I had three people come up to me after this last meeting and say, hey, listen, I got this deal. I don't have a buyer for it. Would you want to run it by your buyer's list? Because I said during the meeting, we love co-wholesaling. If you have a deal, we got the buyer's list. Bring us your deal and we'll run it by our buyer's list and split with you. So they came right up to me and we've got one of those deals working right now. So sorry, long explanation, but I just want to, I want to give that to you to say that's a, a, a really strong tactic that you can wield in your market that's going to pay dividends for you that you can't even imagine. When in, that's awesome stuff. Um, JP, let me, let me know what you think. Um, I, I know you know, we've got a lot of people still on with us. We've got a, a good many questions here. How long do we want to go? Um, I, I don't think we should just go on forever. Um, well, we're, we wanna... at, we're at what, almost two hours now, right? Mm -hmm. um, what, do you, what do you see what we can fit into the next 15, 20 minutes? Let's do, let's see what we can do in the next 15 minutes and call it a night. We've, right. got, we've got two more nights coming after this. That's right. Um, if you, if you hopped on tonight um, a little little late or are, are just joining us, um, this is only part one of a three-part series of training, and we're going to conclude each of them with a Q&A session. Um, we're going to we'll get to as many of the questions that we have here as we can, um, but but may not get to them all tonight as they continue to, to pile in. 
Um, and, and you got one ready just, to go? Yeah, yeah, let's keep it up. Okay. Uh, what if you use your own property to put other homes on it for rentals? I'm sorry, Don, I don't understand that question. What if you use your own property to put other homes on it for rentals? Maybe you could clarify that for me. Um, what are the action steps to do to flip a house and lot? Uh, epif epiphania? epiphania? I'm so sorry, I know I'm butchering your name. Mr. or Mrs. Hall. There you go. Um, what are the action steps to flip a house and a lot? Well, I'm going to assume that the house and the lot are together, that you're talking about, you know, a house on a lot. Um, to flip it, well, the first thing is um, you got to find out if it's a deal. Figure out, is this a deal? Do the numbers make sense? Um, and the way you do that, if you're trying to flip it, now I assume maybe this is not a safe assumption. I'm going to assume you mean wholesale it. You might mean rehab it. I don't know. But um, do the numbers make sense? So you analyze it. If the numbers do make sense, because either you can see a retail market that you're going to sell to, and you can see that the repairs, when you subtract them out and the purchase price leaves a good margin, or you know that there's cash buyers who are buying these types of deals, and you can sell, flip it to them as is for a profit margin. You've determined one of those two things. Then the next step is to um, put it under contract. Um, I'm going to go to the wholesaling route for the rest of this example. If you're, if you, once you have it under contract, you control the property, and uh, you want to market your contract to a list of buyers, to, to cash buyers. Um, if you don't know how to get cash buyers, I refer you to the Knowledge Bomb for 33 ways you can get cash buyers that, that we've posted on the website. Go ahead. Oh, I thought you were going to say something. Um, so you, you want to market that property to your cash buyers. It should be a sweet deal. Uh, if somebody raises their hand and says, yes, heck yes, I want that house and that lot, please give that to me. Then you say, okay, great. Uh, you can then sign another contract to sell to them. Even though you don't own it yet, you can sign another contract to sell it to this new person. As long as you don't close the two of them, you know, you, you don't want to sell it before you buy it because then that's, you know, illegal. But if you, <laughs> if you, if you have a contract to sell, as long as you, you um, buy it even a moment before you sell it, that's totally fine, and you get the spread. That's a simultaneous closing. Or you can just assign your contract over to them for a fee, and they step into your shoes in that contract. Um, you go to closing, uh, you get paid a check. If you did a simultaneous closing, two closings, you pay a little more closing costs, you take title just for a split second, um, and you have to bring some wet funds to the table or you have to have transactional funding of some sort most of the time. Um, if you, uh, but you get a, a check for the spread in the middle. If you just assigned the contract, then you just get your assignment fee. It's just a line item on the HUD and you walk away with a check. Um, deed is transferred to the end buyer and congratulations, you flipped a house or add a lot. Those are the steps. Uh, we've got a question from Donna Willie. Now, what if you use your own property to put other homes on it for rentals? And I asked that one because I couldn't figure out what she was really asking, though, so I went on. I, I couldn't at first, but I think she maybe owns a property already and is asking about what if you were to use a property that you own to put houses on it for rentals, so maybe to build houses on it or maybe to move houses on it. You know, could, can you use a property you already own? to maybe subdivide it and put some other, you know, to build some other houses or put other houses on there or rent it out, sure, there's potential there. Uh, Queen asks, how do I go about buying my first rental property? Well, don't. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I've talked about some of the pain I had with rentals. Uh, here's my first advice. Um, when you are analyzing your rent uh, a possible rental property make sure that you take all expenses into uh, the fa factor them all in including uh, a percentage for estimated repairs and maintenance and uh, a reserve for vacancy don't assume 100 percent vacancy or 100 percent occupancy um, make sure that you take those into consideration make sure that 
your profit margin after principal, interest, taxes, insurance, and a reserve for vacancy and a reserve for repairs is at least, in my view, at least $300, please. No less than that uh, would be my opinion. And I also, frankly, feel like uh, you should go for higher end properties, even though the numbers tend to look pretty sexy on low end properties, the vacancies will eat your lunch. The quality of tenants you're dealing with will eat your lunch if you're not an experienced landlord. Uh, I'd go for houses that rent for at least $1,000 a month or better so you can deal with tenants who are maybe kind of reasonable people like you. I'm a little jaded about tenants. Um, and I've been a tenant, so I feel like I can speak from experience. <laughs> Um, I would also say make sure that you have cash reserves because it's not a matter of if but when you're going to have to replace a roof or a uh, whole central heat and air unit. And if you go into this without some cash reserves to take care of those things. Yeah, I mean, I would not recommend just trying to buy a rental property just so you own a property. Like if there's no, like if, if, if the equity based on what you think it's worth and what you owe is going to be razor thin and the cash flow is going to be negligent, why are you buying it? Why? So, so that maybe if you hold it for years, it will eventually pay down. There's, there's just, just uh, make sure you know why you're buying it when you're going in and leave yourself with some room um, because that room can quickly disappear in an up and down market or you know, if, if, if you're doing a deal that's razor thin and if everything works out, you'll make some money, watch out because something's going to happen and uh, it's better to be safe and have over budgeted for potential repairs and costs and all that stuff than the other way around. Um, I got a question here that I'm going to postpone just for a moment because I want to actually show... Um, I want to show something on my screen to answer it. It's from Tim. He says, um, I just need leads. I have plenty of cash buyers ready. Actually, Tim, it looks like he's already left. He had to cut out, but I still want to answer the question for everybody else. I, what I want to do is show you guys a mind map that we use in our wholesaling company that just shows you the types of lead generation we're doing right now that's bringing in leads. Um, and this just give you a snapshot of kind of what's going on. Um, while I'm pulling that up, Patrick, would you mind answering uh, what are the essential professionals to build a solid team? This is from Queen. Okay. Um, some of the essential, I mean, your essential professionals, uh, my first question would be what's your business model? You know, essential professionals for a wholesaling business versus a buying and holding business is going to be different. Your essential professionals, if you're dealing with mobile homes um, or if you're dealing with single family houses or apartment buildings is going to be a little different. So know your niche, know what types of property you're buying and like having somebody on board like a realtor that can help you value properties, know what stuff's worth. Um, if you're not a realtor yourself or if you don't have those skill sets, um, if your business model has anything to do with repairs, either estimating them so that you can make an, the right offer up front if you're you know, wholesaling or if you're doing the renovations in the back end, having somebody. Like my favorite thing for team building, period, is getting referrals. Um, so getting someone who can help you value property, someone who, who can help you estimate repairs and things that are going to be wrong with the property, those are two extremely valuable um, kind of first team members to have on board, whoever might handle your closings, whether it's a closing attorney or title company. Um, I am a huge fan of going first and foremost to referrals and then only if you don't have a referral to follow up on, only then expanding your search outside of that at that point. Go ahead. By the way, uh, in the video of me, my head, that picture right there it's actually mm -hmm. one of the pictures my dad painted. Oh, cool, man. It looks really weird doing that in the camera. Anyway, uh, so can you see the, the mind map here on the screen? Yeah. Okay. Um, just going to, super quick, high level, just to give you guys kind of a snapshot into what we're doing that, that is bringing in leads for us. Um, <clears throat> we haven't started this yet, but I got this idea from a buddy of ours recently, laundromat flyers, basically uh, paying someone 
uh, to put tear sheet flyers and or business cards in every laundromat in town. That'd be a real easy thing to systematize once a month. Um, mining through the MLS, um, that includes low balls on distressed properties and on old listings. Um, we don't actively do HUD. We have done HUD campaigns. We're not actively doing that right now. Uh, we don't actively buy leads right now either, but we have several channels, ZBuyer and Fast Home Offer that we could. Um, Bandit Signs, Craigslist, we do actively post Craigslist ads. Um, what? What is the sneak attack? You just, the Bandit Sign sneak attack, you're not going to tell us? All right, the Bandit Sign sneak attack. It's, uh, it's I learned this from um, uh, Dwan Bent Twyford. Uh, sorry, I don't think I can't see the whole thing here. Okay. Yeah, we can see it. Uh, 50 bandit signs a month all in one day. So one day a month you go put out 50 bandit signs and you put them in the yards of vacant houses in your targeted farm area because code enforcement doesn't care what's in the yard of a vacant house. So you don't get calls from the, from the, the house cops. And if you have enough vacant houses in the area, suddenly you know the neighborhood looks around and they're like, whoa, this investor like bought up the whole area. He must be the guy to call if I need to sell my house. Um, <laughs> so you can put them up for about you can pay somebody like a buck twenty five or a buck fifty a sign to put them out. Uh, you can use simplecrew.com to track where they get put. Um, yeah, so you know basically that's just kind of in a nutshell that's the bandit sign sneak attack. Uh, Craigslist, um, we run Craigslist ads constantly. Our VA handles that. Um, Post-it notes, I learned that from Cody Sperber, uh, blanketing neighborhoods, uh, certain neighborhoods with post-it notes that look like, they actually look like you missed a package, like like when you miss a UPS package and they stick it on the door, that's what it looks like, but then the message is, we buy houses in this neighborhood. Uh, SEO, we get some traffic because our website is uh, SEO pretty good. Uh, we reach out to landlords uh, sometimes, we haven't been as consistent with that as we should. And uh, tax sale properties is kind of a new one for us. Direct mail is really our bread and butter, though, um, and currently we have campaigns. Ugh, um, currently, we're running absentee owners uh, in our top 15 zip codes that have owned the property for at least 20 years. Um, and I keep, as you can see, I keep track of a lot of this stuff in spreadsheets so that I can repeat, rinse and repeat a lot of it. Um, the uh, probates, um, I've done probates over the years, had a lot of great success with them, didn't do them for a long time just because I didn't have a good system for them, but we've rebooted the systems. So our probates uh, are actually starting back up this week. Um, probates tend to be some of our highest margin deals. Uh, vacant tax defaults, t properties that are both on the tax default list and vacant, that's a great list. Uh, we're just about to send that campaign out uh, early next week. And uh, probate Facebook messages, I'm not going to go into that because we haven't tested that yet. Learned it from a friend. So I got previous campaigns and possible campaigns we're looking at and stuff, but that gives you kind of a window into, um, into the lead generation side of our company. Uh, Man, that's awesome. Yeah. Right. Whoever told you about that mind map software must be awesome. <laughs> He's, he is awesome, REI. Uh, do you have a good deal analyzer program? I we actually, don't. yeah, I already, you know, I, I've been answering a few people just back with a quick private message. Um, okay. But to answer that publicly too, um, if you're looking for a good de deal analyzer program, our good friend, Mr. Daniel or Daniel Clayman. Yeah, I call him Daniel. I guess to simplify things, he just tells people to call him Daniel. I'm going to stick to Daniel. Um, Mr. Clayman has a software called Rehab Valuator. Um, he's got a free version um, and an, uh, a paid version. Even the free version is awesome. Check it out. If you need a link to that, you can email our support and charity can give you a link. He also just made an online platform, just launched it in the past few weeks. And uh, he's still got a free version of that as well. So you don't have to pay anything for the free version and enjoy. The paid version is worth it, though. Um, we we started using it, and it's, uh, it is a pretty sweet, pretty sweet deal. I like what he's put together there. Uh, uh, what is the fastest way to generate leads, and should you set up a business entity? This is Austin Reynolds. 
fastest way to generate leads is probably bandit signs, Austin. Um, you just got to hustle them out there. Um, and a lot of times, if you're your uh, code enforcement is particularly rough. You're going to put them out on a Friday afternoon and pick them back up on Sunday night because code enforcement doesn't work on the weekend. Um, the uh, in terms of should you set up a business entity? Yes, but don't let that slow you down. Like don't don't let that. If you're worried, maybe I shouldn't go out and start trying to do deals and sling mud until I have my business entity. You need to get that out of your mind. You need to make fast forward action, press ahead. But yes, set up a business entity. Um, we we run our uh, our wholesaling company through an LLC. Um, I don't. I wouldn't. I mean, I can't advise you as to what the best entity is for you. I can tell you that um, two friends of mine have training programs. We don't currently sell them uh, on our website, but you can Google them and find them. Uh, I recommend both of them. Uh, one of them is John Heyer, H-Y-R-E, the Real Estate Investor's KISS Guide to Asset Protection. If you Google that, um, that's uh, recommended. And then if you really want to go deep, which I would not recommend maybe right away because this is pretty intense, but it's, it's the best out there is Dykes Botiford at Assets101.com. Dykes is like one of the most brilliant real estate asset protection minds alive today. But it's thick stuff. so. You know, brace yourself. Um, what's next? Well, next I would say is we are about done. Let's uh, oh let's yeah, just go two more minutes here. We'll conclude at ten fifteen Eastern. And um, again, if if we didn't get a chance to get your message, I've been trying to just respond privately to some of these questions too. Um, we we do care about you. And uh, we've got more nights coming where we're going to be available. Jonathan's asking uh, me specifically, was being a broker beneficial to my business? It was, but it wasn't. It wasn't everything. Um, I'm not currently licensed. And by the way, I wasn't a broker. I was an affiliate broker, um, which there is a difference. Um, I don't know. I'm kind of on the fence as to whether it's it's kind of six of one, half a dozen of the other. Uh, a lot of people believe strongly one way or the other. I, I kind of, I don't know. I think the best scenario is to have somebody who's licensed, but it not be you. If you can pull that off, that's the best, like maybe your partner or your spouse. So you don't have to go through those classes and get spruced up on the knowledge and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, sorry, I throw up in my mouth a little bit when I think of that. They do not keep things awesome and fun. All right, you get to choose the last question we wrap up with, buddy. Oh, ooh, the one that just came in. Um, what is your, Michael Nixon asked, what is your favorite beverage, wine or beer? I am going to have to go, I'm, okay. I've, I've become a bit of a beer man in, in an IPA, uh, India Pale Ale. Uh, kind of guy when it comes to beer. Also, I do I do like red wine. I'm a red wine guy, and my kind of go to is usually a cab. But um, IPA beer, like my go to beer is I would say Bell's Two Hearted Ale. It's a beautiful thing. JP, do you have a favorite? It's really uh, it depends. It's a mood thing for me. Um, I tend to probably gravitate more towards beer than wine. Um, and I like darker beers. I do not like IPAs. I think they're. I, I'm just not a hop guy. Um, but I like. I like something really dark. And like the darker, the better. Um, so anything that that matches that description. Uh, except I'm not a big Guinness guy. Um, but besides that, every dark beer I've ever had, I think I've liked. Um, when it comes to wine, one of my favorite kind of go-to wines is called 19 Crimes. So uh, when you when you go look look for a wine called 19 Crimes, it's like uh, maybe 12 bucks a bottle, and it has a picture of an actual criminal on it. And the concept of the wine that it's you know, kind of the silly concept that is framed around is um, in England there used to be 19 specific crimes that if you committed one of those crimes, then you those were the crimes that were 
that would get you sent off to the prison island of Australia. Ooh. And it actually has a picture of somebody who was shipped off to Australia, one of the criminals from back in the day who committed one of those 19 crimes. So, yeah, so you'll see a picture of some old-timey criminal on it. It's called 19 Crimes, and it's really good. Good sure. stuff. Um, all right, guys and gals. Um, we, we've gotten a lot of, or a number of questions on will there be a replay available? Um, right now, we're not sure. Um, please just do your best to make it, um, if you can, to the additional sessions. We've got another training session tomorrow night and another one the next night. If, if, we, do actually, if we do happen to have a replay available, we will let you know. Just keep an eye out. Uh, on the email list for us. And before you go, hit the question box and tell us what you thought of tonight. You know, what resonated with you? What do you yeah. like? What don't you like? Um, what can we do better? And what can we bring you with Awesome REI that will satisfy a need that is going unmet? We're here for you. Boom. Awesome. REI. Thanks, guys. Go read those knowledge bombs. Take care. Cheers to you. Boom. JP and Patrick, we're out of here. I'm going to leave the webinar on. Uh, or Patrick, you leave the webinar on for a few minutes so we can get everybody's comments uh, until they end. But that's a wrap for tonight. I'll nice. catch you guys tomorrow night. Awesome. See you, see you guys. Later. I'm killing my video feed. Bam. trying to figure out how to kill my video feed. I can still see you. I can hear you. <laughs> hey, Benjamin, if you're still on, he asked if we could send him one of them brewskis. Um, haven't figured out how to add a, add a brewski to the chat window yet, but we're, we'll work on it. Let's submit that as a request to go to webinar support. <laughs> a beer me button. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, I figured out how to kill the video feed. Okay. Ooh, here's like a, this is just kind of like after, the webinar is over, by the way, even though we're, right. I'm, I still <laughs> have enough. Um, Robert said specific action items. So maybe tomorrow night and next we can have some good action items. I mean, I know we talked about some actions or questions that you could ask to, uh, to help find your why, but um, we can keep that in mind. That's and and y'all, go over to awesomerei.com. Soak up some of the knowledge bombs that are already there, just eagerly awaiting your attention. And leave a comment. You may be the first person ever to comment on Awesome REI. And I don't know, but I think that's a pretty cool honor to have. So, brownie points for the first person who leaves this comment. Serious brownie points. <clears throat> All right, well, now it's just getting weird, so I like to keep it weird, but not that weird. So I'm going to go hang out and watch, uh, I don't know, a rerun of The Blacklist with the, with the wife. See you guys later. Later, man. Have a good one.